I'm Anna-Rich Portman from the Netherlands. I work at Utrecht University as an associate professor. Um, I'm at the ISSR for about three months as a visiting academic and uh, I was invited to give a talk and it's about legal arrangements in marriage and cohabitation and I hope you enjoy the talk. I've only been here for one and a half weeks now uh, but it's been a really nice here, a quiet environment, nice to work, nice people and for me as a Dutch person lots of sun. <laughs> um, today I'm going to talk about legal arrangements in marriage and cohabitation. Um, I, I've been in doubt what I was going to present here uh, because I also work on legal arrangements after the relationship is over and so uh, at divorce and separation but I decided to present the happy few here so where people are still together and at the start of their relationship <laughs> what do they actually arrange um, if you want to know more about the more pessimistic view on legal arrangements you can always drop by and uh, ask me about this uh, project <laughs> Okay, well, what, what is the background precisely of this research? Well, <laughs> most of you probably know that since the rise in cohabitation, there has been much research on cohabitation versus marriage. So people are very interested in what's the difference between these types of uh, uh, relationship. Is marriage just, uh, is cohabitation just a prelude to marriage or is it really an alternative to marriage? And in the beginning, most research focused on this dichotomy, marriage versus cohabitation. More recently, uh, scholars have become, uh, begun to study also variations within marriage and cohabitation. And thereby they acknowledge that cohabitation isn't the same for everybody. And it might mean different things for different people. And this also holds for marriage. But um, these distinctions have been mostly made in relation to what I call interpersonal commitment. And I mean with that, that are people really committed to each other? Do they have a long time horizon on the relationship? Or is it just trial and error? And the indicators that people usually use are things like marriage intentions. So marriage intentions are a sign that you're actually really committed to your partner or not. And this is surprising because most research so far has ignored that marriage and cohabitation also have legal implications. And in fact, this legal variation has increased over time. Because since the rise in cohabitation, many governments all over the world have introduced some kind of legal uh, form of cohabitation in whatever form. So people are nowadays able to formalize their relationship. So the topic of this talk will be precisely this, to examine the legal variation in marriage and cohabitation, and I do so for the Netherlands. Why the Netherlands? Well, of course, I am from the Netherlands, <laughs> that's an obvious reason, but the Netherlands are also interesting because they have a long history of legalized cohabitation. They introduced cohabitation contracts already in the 1970s, and in 1998 uh, they introduced registered partnerships as well. That was meant for same-sex couples in the beginning, but it's also accessible to heterosexual couples. So we have quite some variation in cohabitation um, uh, types, and we also have different types of uh, marriage. So I distinguish between four main types, marriage in community of property, marriage with prenuptial arrangements, legalized cohabitation, be it either a cohabitation contract or a registered partnership, I'll get that back to that later, and non-legal cohabitation, so nothing is arranged. Why is it important to study this topic? It's one thing saying that there is no research on it, it's another thing saying, but it's especially important to study th this and I think there are three reasons why it's interesting to look at legal arrangements. Um, the first reason is that legal arrangements, the choice of legal arrangements says something about the degree of individualization in society. 
So legal arrangements in marriage and cohabitations have implications for the extent to which we keep property and income separate. So it says something about individualization. Do we keep things separate or do we just pull it all together? It's also relevant from the perspective of rationalization. Do we formalize our relationships or not? So it says something about the degree of rationalization, which is a very sociological term, I acknowledge, but in society. And finally, it says something about the issue of inequality. Because the, the type of union you choose has implications for who gets what after divorce, separation, or in case of death of a partner. And I think this is perhaps the most salient issue. Small may know this example, Stieg Larsen. Um, in 2004 he died and his long-term cohabiting partner didn't inherit his royalties because they weren't married. And I think they're still fighting over these royal royalties. So this goes to show that legal, the type of legal arrangements you make at the start of your relationships are really important also for these kinds of well, what are my research questions? I have two. One uh, descriptive one to start with. What are couples' legal arrangements? How prevalent are the different types of legal arrangements in marriage and cohabitation? And the second one is how can the choice of legal arrangements be explained? Or put it differently, who chooses which kind of legal arrangements? What are the correlates of the different types of legal arrangements? Before I talk about the theory and the findings, I want to—I think it's wise to tell you a bit more about the different kinds of legal uh, union types you have in the Netherlands. Uh, basically, we have five: marriage and community of property, prenuptials, and we have three types of cohabitation, registered partnership, cohabitation contract and non-legal, what I call non-legal cohabitation, where no action is taken. Um, if you marry and you don't do anything, you don't take any additional legal action in the Netherlands, I think that's quite unique in the world, you are married in community of property. I don't know how, how it is in Australia, but many countries marriage prenuptial is more common. But we have by default marriage in community of property. Similarly, if you don't take any additional action when you start living together, you're here. <laughs> All these types, they, they need you to take additional legal action. Um, what, what is important is that all these different legal types imply different rights and obligations. Rights and obligations of partners towards each other towards third parties, and these rights and obligations refer to the period during your relationship, but also after the relationship has ended, for example, because of divorce or in case of death. Um, and these rights and obligations here, in, this, in these different columns, are the most important rights and obligations that distinguish different types of legal arrangements. So it's about joint property rights, alimony rights, inheritance rights, paternity rights, and employer benefits. And with employer benefits, I particularly mean whether people have the right to partner pension after the death of a partner. Uh, and the main message is that if you go from the top of the table, to the bottom of the table, that the rights and obligations that partners have towards each other and towards four third parties become less. So this <coughs> also means that there are fewer interdependencies between partners. So the level of interdependencies between partners decreases when we go from the top to the bottom. So the most legally committed type of uh, union is marriage in community of property. I would say everything is joint. Property, income. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> property, income, and children. So 
there are joint uh, joint property rights. Everything is joint. Uh, people are entitled to alimony after a divorce. Uh, people are by default default each other's hair, 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 yeah, hair, hair. I think it's silent hair. Air. Air. <laughs> and uh, husbands who have a child in marriage are by definition the legal father as well. So paternity rights are also arranged and automatically you have a right to partner pension. So this is the most, this creates the most interdependencies between partners. Marriage with prenuptials is pretty much the same except for this one. So the prenups give you an opportunity to separate property. So, so to say, well, you, 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 you are not entitled to my income or to my assets after a divorce. Then, if we go to registered partnerships, that's the most marriage-like type of cohabitation. Almost everything is the same as marriage with prenuptials, but the main difference is this one paternity rights. So children born in a registered partnerships, then the fathers have to take additional legal action to become the legal father. It's not by default that you are the legal father when your child is born in a registered partnership or in any type of cohabitation. This holds, this is the big difference in the Netherlands between marriage and cohabitation, the paternity rights. Um, you can arrange paternity rights, but it takes two steps. First, you have to acknowledge your child when, you, when the child is born. And second, you have to fill in forms to get legal custody of the child. So you have to do after the child is born. So you can arrange it, but it takes some work. Um, so registered partnership is, is marriage-like, except basically for this one. Cohabitation contract is a little bit less, uh, a, a little bit less legally committed type of relationship, because employer benefits are not always taken care of. It depends upon the employer. Inheritance rights you can only arrange partly via uh, cohabitation contracts, and you can only. Uh, make an agreement about jointly acquired uh, property and assets to say that the partner will inherit these. Uh, alimony rights is an interesting case. Uh, of course, uh, contracts are very flexible and you may arrange alimony rights, but what I heard from legal practitioners so far is that this is very uncommon to do. So people just do not include anything about alimony rights, usually in a cohabitation contract. Joint property is again optional. We may agree anything upon. Then non-legal cohabitation, well, nothing basically is taken care of. You might as well be single in this case. Okay. It's a bit flashy, <laughs> given, the, <laughs> given the topic of the talk. <laughs> um, explaining the choice of legal arrangements. So how, how do we explain what kind of uh, legal arrangements that, that are people in? Um, I must admit there wasn't very much theory on this topic. So I basically made it up myself and I hope it makes sense. So if there are any comments about my theoretical ideas, please let me know. Um, I have three assumptions here. First, I assume that there are two types of main variations between these different union types. The first is, and that's what I already said, that these legal arrangements vary in the level of interdependency between partners. So marriage and community, of property is the most legally committed type, creates the most interdependencies uh, between partners, and non-legal cohabitation is the least uh, committed type. In addition, legal arrangements also vary in the extent to which they allow for specific tailor-made agreements. And it's especially the cohabitation contract and the prenups that allow for such 
for really tailor-made agreements. Not just the default agreements that you get in community of property or in case of non-legal cohabitation, but here you can really say, for this case we do this, and if that happens we do this, so you can be very specific here. So these are the main variations between the, the different types of legal arrangements. The second assumption is that people base their choice on these types of these two types of variations. So they ask themselves, how much interdependency do I need or do I want? And or they ask themselves, do we need tailor-made arrangements? Uh, and I assume that the second question is only relevant when you make for infrequent and high-stake issues. You won't set up tailor-made agreements for things that are constantly changing. So it's a one-shot decision and there's much at stake. If, if there's not much money involved, for example, you, you probably don't think it's worth to take all this additional action, which also costs money, by the way. So, I assume that they will do only these tailor-made agreements for infrequent and high-stake issues. And the third assumption is uh, that I make a distinction between rational and uh, normative reasons to opt for these different legal arrangements. So let me explain, because this is quite abstract. Let me start with the rational reasons. What are rational reasons for people to choose for a certain kind of legal arrangement? First of all, uh, I, uh, there's a group of factors which I label other dependencies. So when there are other dependencies, a lot of other dependencies between partners, they will opt for more or less legal uh, commitment. And children are perhaps the most obvious example. If you have children, in general, you want more legal commitment because you want to protect the children. You want to arrange paternity rights, you want to arrange uh, inheritance rights, alimony, because you want the best for your children. So in general, it seems plausible to assume that when you have children, you're likely to opt for more legal commitment. So marriage in community of property will be the most likely followed respectively by marriage with prenups, legal cohabitation, and lastly, non-legal cohabitation, which is probably most unlikely for couples who have children. A second factor that creates dependencies between couples is specialization <coughs> in paid and unpaid labor. So, if one of the uh, partners is specialized in paid labor, partners may decide that they want to protect the other partner who specializes in the household from the risks of specialization. And a risk of specialization is that you end up with nothing when the relationship ends. So, my idea is that the more specialized couples are, the higher the legal commitment they want. Of course you can argue otherwise and take a more egoistic stance here and say, well, the one who's doing most of the paid labor may want to protect his, usually his, income from that the wife will get it after a divorce, for example. But first of all, um, there's this other person who has the opposite interest. She wants protection, so there's a conflict of interest here. And second, they are at the start of the relationship, so I doubt whether they are already thinking breaking. Yeah, about breaking up and thinking, thinking this, well, this really sort of egoistic view on, on, on this couple relationship. So that's why I decided, that's why I decided to go for this one here. Um, then, a third uh, type of interdependency is owning a house. That's a big step, uh, lots of money, so you could say that if people uh, decide to buy a house, they will opt for more legal commitments to make sure that the other one uh, inherits the house after death, 
to make sure that, uh, that, that the other one can stay in the house for a while, at least uh, after a divorce. So they will opt for more legal commitments. You could also say, well, this is also an infrequent high-state decision, so people opt for more tailor-made agreements and then you would expect that especially prenups and legal cohabitation will be most common relative to non-legal cohabitation and marriage in a community of property. So you can have two ideas here. A third group of factors is the stakes of third parties. As said, all these legal arrangements also have implications about uh, they also specify the rights and obligations towards third parties. And children are an obvious, from previous relationships, are an obvious example of uh, third parties. If you have children from a previous relationship, uh, you are likely to make tailor-made agreements. Because you want to make sure that the children, these children, inherit in case of death. So if you would marry, just marry, in the Netherlands it would be the case that the, child, that the new partner inherits everything and that the children have to wait. So to ensure, and the new partner can just spend the money, so to ensure that uh, the children from previous relationship uh, get their share, you have to draw prenups or you can also uh, arrange this, in, for example, in a cohabitation uh, contract. Um, otherwise, it's hardly possible to get this arranged well. Then, another type of third party parties is associated with being self-employed. If, if you have a company, there are other people who uh, you may have debts, for example. So in this case, you also want to prevent that your partner becomes responsible for the debts of your company. So you want to have joint, so you want to avoid joint property. You want to keep things separate. Uh, so one idea is that you will opt for less uh, com legal commitment, because that ensures that property is uh, separate. Or you may opt even for more uh, tailor-made agreements make it more specific, because again, this is a very high-stake and one-shot decision to be arranged. A third rational reason might be insecurity, and this is very uh, straightforward. If you are insecure about the relationship, you want to avoid interdependencies between partners, because you want to be, uh, yeah, it should be relatively easy to leave the relationship. So, insecure, if you're not sure about the relationship, you will opt for less legal commitments. Finally, there could be something like the awareness of problems. How much are people actually aware of these rights and obligations? Uh, implied by these different legal arrangements. And I think awareness of problems arises when you had previous experience with a divorce. For example, your own divorce or a parental divorce. But I'm not sure what's, yeah, what's going to happen then. On the one hand, you can say, if I have experienced a divorce, I know that you also have, to, if a marriage ends, you also have to share after the relationship is over. You become aware of that. So for men, this may mean, oh, I want to avoid this the next time. My new wife shouldn't have rights to my income. And for a woman, it might be the other way around, because she's usually the lower income spouse. So she may say, no, next time. Make sure that we arrange this thing, these things well. It could also mean for both men and women that they, they become more aware of what's mine and what's yours. So they say, let's make sure that we at least uh, arrange things in the sense that we know this is yours and this is mine. So I'm not sure what the effect will be on the type of legal arrangements that people will choose. Then normative reasons. 
uh, people might also have more or less progressive norms. And with progressive norms, usually in family sociology, we mean by that that they are more focused on uh, autonomy, individualization, and so on. So the more progressive people are, you would say that the more they want to avoid inter interdependencies between partners. So the more progressive people will uh, opt for less legal commitment than the more conservative people. Well, the findings. What data did I use? I used the Netherlands Kinship Panel Study, the first wave, uh, that was held between 2002 and 2004. And this panel study includes about 5,000 heterosexual cohabiting and married couples. But I made some selections here. For example, the, minimum, the maximum age uh, should not exceed 65 because we're looking at specialization effects. Uh, both partners had to fill in the questionnaire. So, after these selections, I end up with almost 600 cohabiting couples and 2,638 married couples. And the unique thing about this survey is that uh, respondents reported about their legal arrangement at the time of the survey. So, if they were married, they were asked whether they had prenuptials. And if they were cohabiting, they were asked whether they had a registered partnership or a cohabitation contract. And on the basis of this, this question, I distinguished four main types. I already said so, community, uh, property of, of community of property, prenups, <coughs> legal cohabitation, and non-legal cohabitation. And that means that I combined these two, the registered partnerships and the cohabitation contracts. Uh, there was a reason to do so. Um, the interesting thing was that a third of the cohabitors who say that they have a cohabitation contract also say that they have a registered partnership. And that's legally impossible. You cannot have both. So this implies that people, people actually don't know what they have. So they confuse a contract with a registered partnership, which is already interesting in itself, I would say. Um, and the other thing is that if you look at the people who report that they only have a re registered partnership, I ended up with only 38 couples. So it's too few people to uh, distinguish a registered partnership from having a cohabitation contract. Well, to answer the questions, um, I use, of course, simple percentages for uh, the research question about the prevalence. And for the second research questions about what the correlates are of the different types of um, legal arrangements, I, look, I use multinomial logistic regression with the four types of uh, legal arrangements as the dependent variable. I explicitly say correlates because it's sectional data. We don't know the direction of the causation. It can also be that the other way around. If you have high, very high legal commitment, you will specialize because you are uh, insured against the risks of specialization. So, so it's correlates. Let's, it's a, it's a caution, cautionary note here. I cannot say anything about causal order. The first research question, how does it look in the Netherlands, at least at the beginning of this century? Um, well, the majority opts for default marriage, about two-thirds, followed by marriage with prenuptials, that's about 16%. And for the cohabitation, well, it's about an equal share. 9% non-legal and 9% opts for a legal cohabitation. If, you, if we look within married and cohabiting couples, we see that among the married couples, that 20% has prenuptials. So remember, community, uh, joint property is the default. So 20% of the married couples takes additional action and draws on prenup, prenups. And for cohabitation, this 
percentage is about 50%. So 50% of the cohabitors in the Netherlands takes some additional action when they, legal action when they uh, enter cohabitation. Then the second research question. Who opts for what kind of a relationship? Uh, and these are the findings in a nutshell. So I expected that specialization, children and having a, a being a homeowner would be associated with more legal commitment or in the case of owning a house, more tailor-made arrangements. Um, well, for specialization, our, my idea is not confirmed. For children, it's partly confirmed and only for home ownership we find a confirmation of the idea that um, people make tailor-made arrangements when they own a house. So let's have a look at the findings in more detail. Um, ah, if you want, you can spread this around. These are the tables. Um, I didn't want to present uh, multinomial logistic regression tables. As you may know, they are very, well, they're not easy to interpret at first sight. So what I did instead is I calculated predicted probabilities of being in a certain type of legal arrangements depending upon the independent variable. So in this case I predicted the, I calculated the predicted probabilities of the four types of legal arrangements for households that were have various degrees of specialization. This is much easier uh, to look at than the tables, but you have the tables here on paper if you, if you think, oh, this is interesting, you can have a look at that as, as well. Um, I see that the white areas are really white here. <laughs> <laughs> it's not so on my uh, computer screen. Uh, this is supposed to be white, grayish white, <laughs> and that's the uh, uh, marriage in a community of property. So, if, if the lines are not there, it means that they are married in a community of property. I'm sorry. Um, what, 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 what we would have expected to see here is that in case people were really specialized, Marriage and joint property would have been the relatively common. And when they, so here, we would have expected to find many people, relatively many people, in this white area. And when they are not specialized, we would have expected to, uh, them to be relatively often in this non-legal cohabitation because you don't need to arrange anything. Well, this is not what we find. In fact, the white areas are relatively small at these two extremes when we compare it to no specialization. What we do see is that prenups become more, relatively more common when people become more specialized, be it the man specialized in paid labor or the woman, this doesn't differ. So is that women specialized in paid labor? In okay. paid labor. So it's not specialization in domestic labor, it's specialization in paid labor. So I looked at the relative share uh, of the woman's working hours in the total working hours. So here, man very specialized, that means that uh, women have a share of 0.15% or less in working hours. So that's the man is basically the main breadwinner. Here it's between 15 and 45%, and this is 45 to 50%, so it's about equal share what they do. And here it's everything above 50% because this group was relatively small when the women do more paid labor than men. The Netherlands is a part-time country. 
especially for them. So that explains that this group is not very big. The biggest group is here, men specialized. Between 15 and 45 percent is the woman's share in uh, total working hours. So prenups are especially common among those who specialize. And what we also see is that uh, when people have an equal division of labor, they are relatively likely to opt for legal cohabitation. And we would expect them to be most likely to be in this black area. So, interesting, I would say. I will, I will get back to this later. It's, it's a puzzle. Children. Well, we would have expected that if you have children, you're, more, you're most likely to opt for marriage and community of property, followed by the other form of marriage, legal cohabitation, and finally, least likely to be in non-legal cohabitation. And what you see is that, especially when you look also at the, the significant effects in the tables, what you see is that children mainly differentiate between getting married or not. So there's no difference among cohabitors, there's no difference uh, between entering legal cohabitation or not depending upon whether you have a child or not. So cohabitors with children are as likely to be in non-legal cohabitation than those without children, which is interesting, I would say. Same holds for marriage. No difference between parents and non-parents in the odds of entering a marriage in joint property, property or marriage with prenups. It's basically about marriage versus any type of communication. Partly confirmed. Home ownership. Now, this is an easy one. Uh, we either expect it to be uh, that they would opt for more legal commi commitment or for uh, the tailor-made agreement uh, stuff. And what you see is that that is what's happening. This area and this area, which refer to prenuptials and legal connotation, are relatively large compared to these two areas here. So it seems to be the case that when you own a home, you're more likely to opt for these things tailored types of uh, agreements. Third parties. Prior children. We expected them to be most likely in uh, types where you can make tailor-made agreements like prenups or a legal contract, <coughs> legal cohabitation contract. Not confirmed we find no significant effects of having previous uh, children whatsoever. <coughs> Self-employed, I say not confirmed. It's not completely confirmed, I would say. We would expect them to be either opting for less legally committed types of relationships or these tailor-made, but what we find is that they are particularly likely to be in the prenup <coughs> marriage. So in part this is what you would expect. So they are over underrepresented in the marriage and community of property. So they avoid a lot of interdependencies and they are also uh, very likely to be in the non-legal cohabitation. Well, also not a lot of commitment going on there. What is a bit unexpected is, is this small area. So they are, you would have expected this area to be bigger, both on the basis of these tailor-made uh, agreements, you would expect that to be especially in these two, but also on the basis of this legal commitment assumption. This area should have been bigger. But I don't think this is really that interesting because if you look at uh, prenups, these are probably the most suited kind of uh, arrangements to arrange issues of self-employment. These are by default used. So maybe cohabitation contracts are not that well 
suited to arrange things that are associated with with uh, self-employment. So, strictly speaking, our hypotheses are not confirmed, but I think it perfectly makes sense from a more practical point of view. They choose to separate their property. Insecurity, partly confirmed, because what we do find here is that, indeed, people who are insecure, and I measured it by relationship quality, some items about uh, relationship quality, they are very likely to be in non-legal cohabitation as compared to those who have a high relationship quality. All other stuff, all the other types of arrangements, it doesn't matter that much, it's mainly about being in non-legal cohabitation. That makes sense as well. If you're not sure, why arrange anything at all? Be it a contract, marriage, or whatever. Um, an interesting thing here, and I forgot to say that also with the self-employment part, it's only men, men's relationship quality that counts. And that was also the case with self-employment. So it's men's self-employment and men's relationship quality that matters, not women's. Then finally, the awareness of problems. Does it matter whether you, whether you have experienced uh, a divorce or not? Uh, well, for prior divorce, not significant. And for parental divorce, well, some effects, not much. Again, only for men, not for women. Uh, and it's mostly about being in marriage versus cohabitation. And it's clearer, yeah, you see this is not much difference. You already see that it's not, not big effect, effects, and if you look at the significance, you will find that it's basically that those who experience the parental divorce are less likely to opt for marriage rather than cohabitation. And finally, the norms. The more progressive people were, we expected them to have less legal commitments, and it's partly confirmed. But again, it's mostly about marriage versus cohabitation. So those who are uh, more progressive will, are less likely to opt for marriage and more likely to opt for cohabitation. And similar effects are found for women's, uh, women's norms. Oh, I only show the man here. Okay, uh, a lot of findings, <laughs> a lot of things going on. Let, let me try to uh, come to some sort of a conclusion. Well, the first is that we can conclude that marriage is still more popular than cohabitation. And marriage and community of property is by far the most popular arrangement in the, in the Netherlands. Uh, we also see that about one-fifth of married couples takes additional legal action and this is almost 50% for the cohabitors. So they choose 50% of the cohabitors in the Netherlands opts for legalized cohabitation now basically. What we also see, when I have to summarize it, that relatively many of the factors that were studied here, mainly differentiate between marriage versus cohabitation, and not so much between the different subtypes, legal subtypes. So if you look at having progressive attitudes, parental divorce, and having children, it's basically a matter of do I get married or do I offer for a cohabitation? And in a sense it's a bit worrisome. Because there's this growing group of children who are born in cohabitation and they are perhaps less legally protected than they could be. Because there's no difference between those who have children and those who don't in opting for a legalized cohabitation. I say perhaps because we just don't know whether they took these additional legal steps 
to acquire paternity rights? We don't know. Maybe they do. We don't know. And maybe they draw up wills. Because you can always also draw a will to make sure that everybody gets what they are, what, yeah, what you want them to get them after death. So that's why I say perhaps they do not legalize their cohabitation, but maybe they take additional action. I don't know. Um, so the first conclusion is. Often it's about marriage versus cohabitation. We also see that there are also some obvious uh, factors that should be, at least to my, in my opinion, should be associated with legal commitment, but they are. They are not significant. Particularly these children from previous relationships. People do not seem to uh, arrange things for them by making tailor-made agreements. So again, this is a bit worrisome here, because you would expect people to draw prenups to protect these children. And furthermore, there are of course also correlates that do affect the choice for different legal sometimes, but not always as we expect them to uh, be to have an effect. So home ownership and self-employment, as said, are more, more or less what we expect them to be. So if you are a homeowner, you opt for uh, prenups or legal cohabitation. And this makes perfect sense, because when you uh, buy a house, you go to a legal practitioner, and he or she, to draw up the mortgage act, and he or she will tell you, yeah, but then you should also make sure that you have a computation contract or that you draw prenups to arrange things really well. So here it's, they, they come into contact already with a legal practitioner. So this, this, this makes sense. And with self-employment, also makes sense. The people are already really aware of legal and financial issues when you have a company, when you own a company. So practical reasons that already apply dealing with financial and legal issues anyway are associated with these more tailor-made uh, agreements in a contract and on prenuptial. Specialization, well that's my big problem. What we can at least conclude is that the need to protect economically dependent partners against the risk of specialization, that's not what's happening here. Rather, it's the other way around. They are more likely, the highly specialized couples are more likely to opt for these prenups. And these prenups are often used to separate property. So, maybe people are more egoistic than I want them to be. <laughs> uh, I, I, I simply don't know what's going on. This seems to be a very plausible reason that the one who's really specialized wants to protect his or her income. Um, and another puzzling thing is these non-specialized couples. Why are these non-specialized couples uh, especially opting for legal cohabitation? And I have a clue here. Um, I think that that people who tend to uh, divide paid labor equally are more progressive anyway. And they are probably also uh, more individualized than other people. So they will opt to begin with more likely for uh, cohabitation rather than marriage. And that's also what you find in the significance. So they are far more likely to opt for cohabitation to begin with. And then they, because they are so individualized, they want to make sure that this is yours and this is mine. So we draw up these legal contracts to ensure that everybody gets what he or she is entitled to, given his or her uh, efforts in, in all 
to give paid labor, for example. So that's my clue here. But especially the prenups, it's yeah, it's 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 impossible. And finally, what you also find is that his characteristics matter more than hers. We find that for self-employment, relationship quality, and parental awareness. Also a puzzle, or maybe men are just more aware of all these legal and financial issues than women. So they will be more likely to act on, upon it. All in all, I think this study raises some doubts about whether people are actually aware of all the legal implications. Uh, people don't seem to be aware of what a registered partnership is. That's what I found in the, when looking at these different types of legal arrangements. And, well, why don't they arrange things when they have children from previous? Relationships, for example, it's so obvious to do something then, but people just seem to not act upon that. So it's just speculation, but I want to give some sort of message at the end. I, I think that people basically choose between marriage and cohabitation, and only when they have to deal with financial and legal issues anyway, like for example, buying a house. Uh, or having a, a company by yourself, then they will take additional legal action and draw up some kind of contract. Um, as said, it's just speculation. But I think more research is needed in this area to really get a grip on what's going on here. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>